good afternoon everyone and welcome to this session um, as part of our accessible services in family hubs session this afternoon we're going to be talking about the role of peer support in co-producing um, accessible and inclusive um, family hubs please note that in this session we are going to be recording today so if you don't want to appear on screen please do turn off your cameras we would also appreciate it if you were able to stay on mute um, at least until it comes to the q a session so that we don't have any background noise when the presenters are presenting um, but please do feel free in the q a session to unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question and you can also turn your video on then if you would like to do so. Um, we will have the um, a recording of the session appearing on the Anna Freud YouTube channel over the coming weeks and the presentation slides will also be shared with you after the event. Um, we do have closed captions available today if you would like to use them please do select the closed captions button on your toolbar. Um, I'm Bronya Arnott, I'm Regional Coordinator for the National Centre for Family Hubs and I'm delighted today to be um, welcoming a number of speakers who um, I'm really excited to hear from and I hope you are too. So without further ado I wanted to um, do a very brief introduction to peer support and then get straight into hearing from our fabulous speakers. So we know that parents and carers do need help from time to time. Um, particularly at the start of their parenting journey, this can be true during those critical first 1001 days to ensure that every child gets the best start in life. But often parents and carers only need very light touch support. And sometimes this can be best provided by others who have experienced similar issues themselves. And this is where peer support can come in. So peer support should be a key part of your family hub offer. And it is important to ensure that um, peer support, which is available through family hubs, is inclusive to all families, is tailored to the needs of those families in your area, addresses barriers to access so that everybody can access the support, the support that they need. And the support that you offer should be evidence-based, Should so it should be based on evidence about what works and um, what practitioners tell us that works well in terms of delivery, and also ideally to be informed by families so that they are getting the support that is right for them. So in our peer support breakout session today, you're going to hear a bit about what the evidence tells us about peer support, what local areas tell us about effective delivery of peer support. And we're going to hear from a peer supporter themselves about what families are wanting um, in terms of the services and support that they're receiving. So we are first of all going to hear from Kirsten Asmussen and she is head of What Works Child Development from the Early Intervention Foundation. She's going to be talking about the evidence base for peer support. Um, we're then going to hear from three local areas from Samira and Tayab, who is public health programme lead at Tower Hamlets, who's going to be talking about peer support for um, infant feeding. We're then going to hear from Helen Lomas, from uh, a service manager from Sheffield City Council, who's going to be talking about peer support for dads and male carers. And we will then hear from Katie James. And um, Katie is from a service manager at Family Action, Better, Spot, Better Start Bradford. And alongside her talking about um, peer support from the on the ground um, peer support uh, role, joins us um, Ethne Dodwell. She is a peer supporter in Better Start Bradwell, Bradford. So we're going to then have a Q&A session and some closing remarks. So um, I'm gonna invite Kirsten to come on now and I'll stop sharing. And Kirsten, if you would like to share your slides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rania, um, can everybody hear me? Um, just to make sure. Yes, I can. Great. 
Um, so yeah, I'm very um, happy to be able to come here and share some, uh, uh, some findings from some research that we did actually last year um, on behalf of Deluc, uh, who were considering um, the use of peer support actually in the delivery of high-end services. Um, and uh, so this, this was done actually to see how they might be delivering, for example, um, various forms of therapy, et cetera. Um, and so I think it's really useful to start out and, and just to make sure, uh, raise the hands again, um, people saw me move that slide, you saw the transition there. Yep, great. Okay, what, you know, what do we mean by peer support? Well, this morning we saw some lovely examples of uh, peer support. It's, it's basically, and I think when we're talking about family hubs, we are talking about parent to parent, and we get to be talking about child to child, but this presentation is about parent to parent. Um, and so there is peer support where you have individuals who have very similar characteristics supporting each other. You have then voluntary support, which is similar and yet dissimilar from peer support because quite often peer support is voluntary, but volunteers more generally don't necessarily have to be peers. Um, and then you have community champions, uh, which are volunteers and they as also can be peers, uh, peers perhaps defined more loosely because they have a shared interest, um, but they're maybe coming together for a shorter period of time to get a specific piece of work done. This is what we'll, we'll be talking about all three groups here and what the evidence tells us. This won't advance. Here we go. So why peer support? Um, I, when we looked at the evidence, we were trying to test, you know, what are people trying to accomplish with this? What, what are the advantages of it? And, and we could find five key assumptions. Um, and, and the one is that parents are more likely to accept support from people that they perceive uh, similar to themselves. So in fact, it will increase recruitment. Um, assumption number two is that services run by peers will better reflect what's needed in the com community and, and therefore people will come because they, they know better than anybody else what will work for them. Um, uh, there's also a third assumption and that is that they, if you have people who um, go through the intervention or the, the activity and, and they learn from it, then they go on and they, they, they learn it to, so they can deliver it, that they will learn um, new skills. So there's kind of this empowerment approach um, going back to the origins of some of these parent run uh, peer support programs, the idea is that actually with that increased engagement, the parents are more likely to learn skills in a way that it will benefit their children. So actually there's an added benefit for their children. Um, and also then there, uh, there people believe that there's going to be some economic savings uh, by running a uh, peer um, peer support or voluntarily led services. So those are, um, and, and I should put another one on here that we didn't look at and is that is that peers enjoy doing this. Um, certainly that, you know, all, any of us who've been involved in a local club or at a village day or whatever, that there's a fun side of this. Um, we didn't investigate that one, but I, I'm just putting that out there. So what does the evidence tell us? And um, again, this, this goes back to the work that we did for Deluc. Uh, you know, at, at the bottom, we have temporary volunteers for, as community champions. And at the top, we're delivering high-end services. We have clinical psychologists, you know. So can they be run by peers was the big question that we had. And the answer to that, well, the, the, the strength of evidence goes up with the level of qualification. Um, and there are a variety of different reasons of, um, for that. I mean, obviously, there's greater expertise um, at the higher ends for delivering these services. Um, but the point that I wanna emphasize here is that um, when you have a formally run service, you've got checks and balances in place for quality assurance. And that also contributes to the, the strength of evidence because you have consistency in the quality of delivery. And so it's not to say that these other activities aren't necessarily useful or effective, but you're not necessarily gonna get that sustained evidence because you don't, they, quite often their nature precludes some of these quality assurance uh, features that are put in uh, with higher end services. So I'm just, I'm just putting this out there at the beginning that perhaps if you can add some quality assurance to the peer support, you can gain effectiveness. 
Um, and just to, to, to summarize at the very beginning what some of the core challenges are um, in delivering peer support is that there are challenges on those receive on the end of those receiving it and those delivering it, and, and many of these do involve with um, quality assurance issues. So some is that the parents may be having difficulty understanding the support advice that's being delivered. Uh, they don't have the capacity to act on it. Uh, they actually might not uh, trust the the practitioner delivering it, um, even though he or she may be a peer. Um, in some cases, uh, they might not think that they need the support. So there's a challenge that needs to be overcome that the peer needs to know how to do. Um, or the, the support that's being offered to them um, it is, is being offered in a way that it, it's, it's addressing a problem that they're not recognizing that they have. These are all challenges uh, on the side of the parents on the sides of the peers um, is that they might not actually fully understand the support that they are delivering. Um, in some cases, you find that they may in fact not trust or respect the families that they're delivering it to. Um, on the other hand, you can find the opposite where they're overly sympathetic and uh, therefore have difficulties drawing the right uh, boundaries. Um, and I think one of the biggest caveats uh, that we found in our research is that Peers are only, there, there's a time limitation on this, you know, particularly when you're talking about uh, families with young children. Um, normally, the definition of peer has to do with the age of the, the other parent, parent or the age of the child. And once the child is older, their, their peer, they become increasingly less a peer. So what did we find out about assumption number one? Uh, are parents more likely to accept support from individuals they perceive as similar to themselves? Um, this is by and large true that parents are more likely to come along to a group or a program, at least initial, initially, um, because they do think it's going, they, they trust the advice because it's somebody who's had the same experience that they have had. Um, however, this is mostly true if they're looking for, as was said earlier by Branya, light touch advice. Uh, you know, it's almost like going to a friend and saying, did this work for you or what did you find out? If they're really struggling uh, with a uh, some issue, more complex issues with a child or within the family, they want to get some expert advice too. So the, the message here is peer support um, can be more appealing to, uh, to parents, but it's not a replacement for professional support. And here are some examples of peer support that works. The first four are on our guidebook at the Early Intervention Foundations. One of them is a program called Empowering Parents, Empowering Communities, which has a nice feature where peers um, uh, or, or parents can go to the program and then they have an opportunity to train and deliver the program. Uh, one po point that I want to make is that they are actually paid when they get to that level and they're to a certain degree vetted and then they're supervised by a social worker or clinical psychologist. So it is, it is a um, highly professionally supported scheme. Uh, parents as First Teachers is a home visiting intervention, a home learning environment intervention. It is delivered by uh, practitioners, uh, most, uh, mostly with some background in teaching. Um, however, there is an element that goes alongside it where there are these parenting groups. Um, parents as First Teachers sets this up, but the, it's run by parents. Um, and so it has this peer element to it. Uh, similarly, with families and schools together, uh, that, that's operated through schools, but parents who complete the program then go on and then they run these parenting groups for actually a number of years for a cohort of parents that are the same parents with them year on year on year. I'm not sure that at families and schools together is offered as frequently as it once was in this country, but it is a nice model of peer support. Similarly, with Strengthening Families uh, 10 to 14, this is a program for uh, reducing risks in the uh, early adolescence. Uh, parents who have finished the program then become ambassadors, and they are quite instrumental in recruiting other parents to the program. I think all these models actually work, and that idea of delivering to peers by peers is, is enforced through the program. Uh, infant feeding support schemes we know do work, um, and it does increase, um, for example, breastfeeding rates, at least initially it does. Again, though, uh, studies show that it's not necessarily a replacement for lactation advice, um, similarly for smoking cessation. And of course, 12-step models uh, are, are, are uh, uh, led by peers. And that is a key, um, people believe that that is part of the active ingredient. But we also know that 12-step models start to fall apart 
if they if there isn't some reinforcement for that 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 peer engagement. Um, one thing that we do know from the research is that peer support is typically more effective for the least needy. So the, the individuals who benefit from it the most are the ones who have the, the have the are, are in a position to gain from it. We call this in the uh, research the Matthew effect comes from a, a, a quote in the Bible that says, those who have a lot will, will get more and those who will have less uh, stand at risk losing more actually from some of these situations. And this certainly was a finding um, going back, you know, 15 years to sure start that sometimes these peer support schemes didn't work quite as well as people had hoped that they would. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind is that even though uh, some people might assume that these interventions might not be stigmatizing. Actually, for some parents seeing very able-bodied parents run them, uh, it could be even more stigmatizing than you might have originally assumed. Uh, so assumption number two, services run by peers will better reflect local needs. Uh, this, this is the assumption that underpins most community empowerment models. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit now. Um, uh, one, the couple of caveats around this is that actually parents are busy people. And so even though this, this face value is true, most parents don't have time to get involved or have an interest because they're competing priorities. Uh, certainly in my community, most of the peer support uh, 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 activities are run by people my age, which means uh, fair, fairly without any children. Um, Although there are obviously mom schemes and things like that, but those are individuals who are in a good place to, to run them. Um, and so what we find, again, is this imbalance where the needs of a vocal minority or an able minority are reflected rather than the needs of the entire um, community. Um, so what we need to watch out for is that we put systems in place to make sure that they are as actually as inclusive as they possibly can, but also as representative as they possibly can. And that means putting some checks and balances into the setting up of these schemes so that everybody can be involved or at least their voice can be shared. Assumption number three, services run by peers ensure that the individuals running um, them learn and sustain new skills. Um, i.e. increase their dosage to make it a better intervention for the, those who are intending it. And I think that we have found that, for example, uh, in the empowering parents, empowering community uh, model, that definitely parents who, who go through the whole program, it is an incentive to go through all of it, and they do learn skills in a way that they retain them. Um, but once again, the, the, those who benefit the most are, in the, are the least vulnerable. Assumption number four, increased use of peer-led services will have a positive trickle-down effect for the children. Uh, this, like I said, was an assumption underpinning Sure Start and even goes back to the 70s uh, in, in big US programs like Head Start. Uh, and this again has to do with increased engagement through the programs. Um, there is in fact some, some evidence to show that this is um, true because parents sometimes gain uh, confidence through these things that they might not have had through other types of program. But we really don't know um, the extent to which this aspect of certain activities is beneficial for children, uh, because quite often other things are going on. Parents, parents are in fact learning better parenting skills, so that, that might be contributing to the improved outcomes. Finally, the last assumption, what? I was just gonna jump in and say yeah, just a the, moment. The last now. assumption is that services run by volunteers are cheaper. Um, this isn't upheld by the evidence. Um, they're quite often as expensive to run and maintain um, and quality assurance as, as paid services. So this isn't something people do to save money. Uh, and this is because there's usually high attrition amongst non-paid peers and volunteers. Uh, and studies frequently show that peer involvement um, and, and that inclusivity does not occur in the absence of various infrastructures that actually cost money to set up and run. Uh, to increase uh, inclusivity. So very briefly, the conclusions are uh, peer support has the potential actually to be in effective mostly for parents if one, the peers are paid, it's they're providing simple advice um, uh, and it augments the support provided by more highly paid skilled uh, practitioners and it's representative. So that's all I've had to say and happy to look, I'm looking forward to questions later on.
Thanks so much, Kirsten. Um, I'd now like to welcome Samira. Samira, I think um, Haley's going to be sharing your slides. So while Haley does that, I'll introduce Samira. Samira is um, Public Health Programme Lead in Tower Hamlets and is going to be talking to us about peer support for infant feeding. Lovely, thank you. <coughs> so hi everyone. So my name is Samara. I'm currently a Public Health Programme Lead for Maternity and Early Years in the London Borough of Tower Hamlets. Um, and I've been with Public Health for many, many years and particularly uh, commissioning the infant feeding service that we've had in the borough for a very long time. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just talk a little bit about the Tower Hamlets model that we have, uh, history and evolution. So our, so we are Tower Hamlets, one of the London boroughs, one of the most deprived London boroughs, actually. So very, very high child poverty rates, unfortunately. Um, we have a infant feeding and well-being service, as it's now called. It was set up by this lovely lady you can see in the picture, uh, Joy Hastings. She was a midwife and a BFN volunteer. She helped set up the service initially and ran it for decades and then retired in 2020. Um, so over the years, breastfeeding rates in Tower Hamlets have increased year on year, with a few exceptions. Um, so can I have the next couple of buttons, please, so we can see the rates. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, so as you can see, uh, in 1999, so not very high breastfeeding rates for six weeks. Um, and then, but in 2019, obviously, we've shot up quite a bit. Um, and this is not only to do with the work of the infant feeding of service, obviously, but more that it, the role it plays um, alongside the other support services and health professionals that we have within the borough. So we've always been above the London average, um, except a few times, obviously, where we've had um, COVID impact. And I think everyone would have seen that. So we actually had the first BFN drop in uh, in Tower Hamlets in one of our children's centres. And we have had the tier three accreditation for BFI since 2012. The next slide, please. Thank you. So like I said, so we have a peer support service. It was originally called the breastfeeding service and at some point the baby service as well. So when we last recommissioned it back in 2018, I believe, we renamed it the infant feeding and well-being service um, to make it more inclusive of mothers who chose not to breastfeed or those who chose to mix feed, which is quite a high proportion in Tower Hamlets because of the population that we have. Oh, can we go back? The slide. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's a service that's commissioned by public health ourselves, and it's prov provided by the BART NHS Trust, and they are based in the Royal London Hospital. Um, so just a very quick overview of staff. So we have a service manager, a deputy manager. We have peer support workers, and then we also have volunteers within the service. And just a very high level sum up of the role of our peer supporters. So we have the, they are on the postnatal ward seven days a week. They do proactive phone calls to all new mothers. Um, and this is, I think, kind of the gold star of our service. And then following these phone calls, we do visit, uh, we did not visit. So we do offer a home visit to all parents. Um, most of them take them up. And then we also do drop-ins, virtual drop-ins as of um, just a couple of years because of COVID, and then antenatal and postnatal courses and drop-ins as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so as part of our core infant feeding and wellbeing service, we have a subcontract with uh, BFN to provide the volunteers. So they are integrated within our core service. We have a volunteer manager in post who leads the uh, volunteer recruitment, retention, training, et cetera. The volunteers do run or volunteer at drop-ins alongside the peer support workers that we have. They also volunteer on the maternity ward, supporting the service with both drop-ins and actual one-to-one -one support on the postnatal ward. Uh, they also run and support the virtual workshops. Um, so BFN train new volunteers a couple of times a year. And then as part of their contract, they also provide the supervision and the volunteer for workers. So when, Kirst, so when the, uh, the previous speaker was talking about kind of the quality assurance role um, of training, this is where we have the BFN 
um, element of it. Next slide, please. So what's helped make our infant feeding support service, the peer support workers work and what's helped us get the rates that we have? So the name and the placement, I think, is the first thing. So the fact that we are called the infant feeding support service, a bit late in the day, but what it what it does, it makes it inclusive. So it's not just, oh, if you're not breastfeeding, we're not going to help you. So it's around responsive feeding and making sure that when you know parents are bottle feeding, they're doing it safely. And the placement as well. So the fact that it's based within Royal London Hospital, I think, is one of the is one of the big pushes for us. Um, it's the best place to be. Um, as our current service that we have is due to end next year. So as we explore kind of recommissioning options, one of the first things that always comes to mind from whoever we talk to is if it happens to go out of Royal London, what we how will we get access to the postnatal women? So placement is a big thing for us. Um, Again, the whole point um, of peer support is a recruiting from service users and community. Um, and then a big thing is also the continuity of care. So the fact that we start speaking to pregnant women during the antenatal phase and then go on to offer support actually on the ward and postnatally, sometimes the, uh, you know, a, a new mum will have seen the same uh, peer support worker when she was pregnant on the ward had the same phone calls from her and then had a home visit from her as well. So it's that that bond and that relationship and that trust that they build with the support worker. I think that's really key. Um, also, because so, we, we hire or we recruit women from the community, it allows us to then, then offer tailored support groups to reflect the community. So an example of this is two. So we've um, in, Bang in uh, Tower Hamlets, obviously very high, population from Bangladesh. So we have run um, support groups that are specifically delivered in Bengali. So that's to you know reflect the community need. And then also in Tower Hamlets, there's a big thing around living with extended families. And a lot of the feedback that we were getting from women is the mums want to breastfeed, but when they're living with their mothers or their mother-in-laws, the, the influence there is too strong um, within the family unit for them to do what they want to do. So what we tried to do to help with this is we ran support groups where we invited women, so the pregnant women and mother-in-laws, grandmothers, mothers, to try and make sure that the importance of breastfeeding um, was given to the entire family who obviously is responsible for how the baby is fed at home. Um, we recently completed an evaluation to inform our recommissioning next year um, and really, really reassuring that the women were, so we spoke to service users, we spoke to health professionals, as well as the peer support workers. Um, and it just, yeah, just reiterated that the kind of the nice gold standard model we have is working. It's what women need, it's what they want. Um, and yeah, so, you know, there's nothing that we're going to really go to change in terms of our peer support delivery model going forward, because everything we have now really works. It will just kind of strengthen certain elements of it. And then the final bit here around priorities and what women want. Um, so anyone from the council will know that at several points throughout the year, services are asked to make savings. Um, and I believe, I think it was four-ish years ago, um, we were asked to make savings from our breastfeeding service. At, well, that's what it was called at that point. Um, and it did not go well. It did not go down well with the local community. Um, the service and local mums were up in arms. And at the end of the day, it was the only service out of the list that had been put forward that did not have its budget reduced purely because the local mums, the local women spoke up and said that they needed the service and that, you know, they wouldn't be able to get what they needed from it if the money for it was reduced. And then linking back to the previous point around kind of some of the assumptions, um, the, the one around um, economic savings now is quite a well-funded service. So we haven't found that having a peer support system in place is actually cheaper to run. Um, yeah, next slide, please. No? 
hopefully there's a next slide. And then in terms of how do we make this inclusive and accessible in the family hubs? So we, so Tower Hamlets, just like everyone else, is kind of very early on in the family hub approach. So we, ha um, so our key, our key thing at the moment is embedding the peer support service within the hubs and strengthening that relationship. And just some of the, none of these points will be new to any of you, is around just co-location, extended opening hours, a hybrid delivery of support. So one we were forced to take up because of the pandemic. But we found that actually um, it works much better for some parents. So, you know, pre-pandemic, we only really did face-to-face -face drop ins and um, community antenatal and postnatal clinics. And now we have those, you know, now we offer them uh, virtual and face-to-face. -face. So we, women are given that option and that's really gone down. So that's something that we'll be taking forward and incorporating into our family hubs to make it more inclusive. Um, Another thing we're hoping that the family hubs will allow us to do is have a stronger cohesion of the, you know, infant, the breastfeeding side, the infant feeding side, and the over the six complementary feeding side. We've never seemed to quite quite get that right in Tower Hamlets. And we're really hoping that maybe having the peer support infant feeding service embedded more strongly into the children and family centers, the family hubs, where a lot of the complementary work complementary feeding work does take place will allow us to get that kind of um it's all one infant feeding kind of policy and practice and then another thing that the family hubs will most definitely be supporting us with is the consistent training and messages that you know the peer supporters are given the health visitors health visitors are given the you know the staff at children and family centers are giving as well so make sure everyone's on the right page and another point that I haven't put in here um not particularly, not not really related to peer support, but I think obviously works it does contribute there. Is the bane of everyone life, and that's data sharing. Um, so we're hoping that having more inclusive and accessible hubs will include um, an element of some more, yeah, a better data sharing that allows us to provide a more kind of um, strategic infant feeding service that we have. And I think that was it, really. Just one other thing is a lot of our peer support workers are part time. Um, and when you look at it, it is a little bit alarming. Um, but obviously what that allows us to do is it allows us to not only recruit a range of local women, but allows us for them, allows a service to then offer them that flexibility of working and you know fitting in that work within a family life. And I think what we were talking about earlier on around um giving back I think is really really crucial um you know whatever the service is going through whatever managerial or white you know higher issues there are um the staff are you know always remain dedicated passionate about the work that they do and that really shows through when you speak to some of the women and um how praising they are of the support that they've received um, and then picking up on one previous, another point is around that relationship. So we, when we've previously asked kind of peer support workers to take that MEC approach and maybe during some of the visits talk about um, maybe long term contraception, for example, or stop smoking, it's never really gone down. Um, so it's linking back to kind of there's some there's some support where you feel is best delivered by a peer support worker and then there's some that's maybe delivered through um like you're saying the highly paid and kind of more skilled health professionals as it were and i think that's it really that's great thank you very much just the time Perfect. um so Haley, if you could stop sharing that and um now i'd like to invite helen to share her slides. Um, Helen Lomas is Service Manager at Sheffield City Council and is going to be talking about peer support um, for dads and male carers. Thanks. Thanks, Bronya. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? And I um, think I'm sharing, so we're, yes. we're good to go. All Lovely. Good. Um, so we've heard lots of, of evidence and examples already, and it's been really, really interesting. And, and thank you for inviting me um, to come and talk today about um, what's happening in Sheffield at the moment. Um, for us in Sheffield, over a number of years, we have developed peer support across a range of services. But what I would like to talk to you about um, today, really, is about how we began to create some inclusive um, peer support for fathers um, in Sheffield. Um, we're still learning, 
and we're still developing um, as we begin our transition as well from family centres to family hubs over this next coming year. But something that we noted um, through 2020, really, um, as we kept our centres open for midwifery and healthcare, um, we, we all know how difficult that period of time was. Um, and for babies born in lockdown, um, we began to see lots of evidence uh, coming out um, around those that time. Um, and evidence showed really for fathers in particular that there, there were no um, peer support um, available. And this became more significant for us when fathers in Sheffield were asking, you know, what is out there for them um, to get that peer support and encouragement um, how can they communicate with other fathers, understanding changes, understanding what's happening um, when having a newborn? And, and basically, they were wanting to support each other in their journeys over this difficult time. So peer support for fathers, why? Um, to enable an inclusive peer support for fathers to be developed, we needed to understand why in the first instance. Why were we actually developing these services? We, we looked at some quotes from the Early Years Healthy Development Review, which clearly state that if we are to level up outcomes for children facing the biggest challenges, this needs to start at home. Evidence also shows us that the families we need to access services don't always do so. And peer support happens when people who have similar experiences of something difficult come together to support each other. However, people involved in peer support will also have other shared characteristics, experiences and interests. Crucially, the people involved play that active role in creating that safe environment for each other. Creating a safe space, people can use their shared experiences to give and receive support from each other. And peers make choices about what parts of their personal experiences they talk about, seek support for, or use to support other people. People can feel less alone if they talk about their experiences and share coping strategies that work for them. By doing this, peers can help each other learn about how best to manage feelings and experiences that are difficult. So what did we do? Um, we looked at what fathers were asking for and we piloted a new way of communicating with them in various different ways. We created um, a physical space for them to meet face to face safely and access both group and one-to-one -one support from our prevention team within the family centres. And we also engage them with other specialists, support across family services in Sheffield as well. This then enabled them to be signposted to other relevant services across Sheffield that, may have, that, that they may have needed. It could have been around mental health or advice with them with regards to benefits or employment support, or accessing information about parenting. These were just some of the queries that we received in the first instance. We created a communication environment via WhatsApp, um, where this became a safe space for them to talk and ask advice of each other. So why was it inclusive and why was it tailored? It was because we listened to what the fathers were asking for to enable us to pilot this way of, of, of peer support. We tailored that specific, those specific requests around group support, group development. We made sure that it was accessible to all by creating those safe spaces in communities close to the areas that fathers were living in and close to particularly um, the areas of disadvantage across Sheffield. you can see from this slide over a period of the first four months um, April to July in 2021 we had a total of 30 fathers engage in this new way of support some accessed one-to-one -one support some accessed the whatsapp group only uh, some accessed parenting groups and others were supported to signpost um, over to other services um, and some of the fathers accessed all of these elements. 
Um, but it was interesting that some of the fathers just dipped into access one-to-one or access the communication via WhatsApp and found that really useful. I just thought I'd share with you some of the quotes that we received when we um, evaluated some of the, this pilot um, group for fathers. Some things highlighted here for me um, are about, you know, the not being left out or let down, um, the improvements there, mental health and well-being, creating something for fathers who what what they wanted to come to and being flexible around actual virtual or face to face really really helped I feel with engagement. And, you know, the flexible and, and accommodating comments were, were just really all the way through the, the fathers, all the fathers that we spoke to. We received some great feedback. Um, and again, the feedback that we received have enabled, it's enabled us to review and think about how such a small investment into peer support for fathers can make a big difference. And as you can see from the, the, the quote um, on this slide, you know, this dad talks about very much that small investment for a large reward and about his wife noticing positive changes in his character since joining the group um, and, and actively encouraging and his wife actually still encouraging that participation, which is really good to see. So after our initial pilot, we were informed of some DFE funded um, research that was happening and um, that we could apply for um, to look at testing what works to increase the reach and take up of family hub services by disadvantaged and vulnerable families. Sheffield made the decision to apply to enable us to look further at how we enhance the engagement of new fathers in our family hub services. We knew that specifically targeting families, uh, fathers who perhaps struggled pre and postnatally was, was paramount to what we were wanting to achieve. And the pilot programme had shown us that bringing fathers together from different backgrounds can enhance their postnatal journey. Research has highlighted that support to fathers in the postnatal period was welcomed and felt that it was impactful in preventing escalation of need and intervention at a higher level. We were successful and we began to work with Sheffield Hallam. A busy slide, the next slide, but this is just about looking at the process that we've looked at with um, the, being part of this research project around behavioural insights. We agreed the inputs into this project and we looked at what activities we wanted. We then looked at the outcomes which as you can see from this slide, include improving self-esteem and confidence, improving understanding of services, improved family relationships, and increased use of family hubs. So we hope, we're, we're not at the end of this research programme as such yet, but we hope by um, looking at this, we will, re we will reach some of these outcomes. And as I've said, we've begun working alongside Sheffield Hallam, who've already undertaken um, focus groups um, interviews with some of the fathers that have been part of the pilot group. Um, we've had a questionnaire um, out to fathers of newborns um, and we've spoken to fathers in group um, format with some of our parenting and uh, early years prevention workers as well. Um, and the project's really pulled together to see how we could move forward better. What we're wanting to learn from this research um, is very much looking at an understanding of the barriers and facilitators to new fathers accessing the groups. This is very much about how do fathers want to see um, post or in, in a family centre or a, you know, a, a social media post for them to actually be interested and want to actually engage in services. A range of behavioural science informed messages um, are being tested um, with these fathers so that we can then begin to think about actually how do we promote new groups 
what interests fathers what do they want to see and identify which messages are the most effective and how we can inform um, and plan to promote uptake of new groups For us, our next steps um, are very much about rolling out the inclusive peer support groups that we've piloted um, last year. We want to empower more fathers to become involved um, and we want to ensure that we develop within that delivery planning for the Family Hub and Start for Life programme. We want to include further peer support programmes um, within this to meet those clear expectations. And we want to engage fathers to become parent champions. We want fathers to be part of that decision-making process moving forward. And we very much want to learn from the research that we are um, working with Sheffield Hallam um, at the moment. But most of all, you know, that father's engagement and father's involvement um, enhances that experience of parenthood for them. And, you know, we build that strong foundation um, with fathers becoming involved across our programmes, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and that's a whistle stop tour of, of what we've been doing in Sheffield. And um, I will hand back over to Bronia. And um, yes, we'll take questions at the end if anybody's got any questions, but thanks for, for listening. That's great. Thanks, Helen. Um, would you be able to stop sharing? And Katie and Ethne, would you be able to um, prepare to share? Um, Helen, if there's anything in the chat that you're able to pick up, then that would be great in terms of questions, because I know that we are going to be a little tight on time and I want to give people the opportunity to sort of have a break as well. But obviously we will um, hopefully get to all of the questions, but if we don't, then I'm sure we can do a sort of frequently asked questions document. So now I'd like to welcome Katie and Ethne, who are going to be talking about perinatal mental health peer support. Thank you, Bronya. And um, hello, everybody. I'm Katie James. I'm the service manager at the Bradford Perinatal Support Service. We are a volunteer peer supporter delivered service. Um, we use volunteer peer supporters to provide listening support to mums. And I'd like to introduce Ethna, uh, my colleague, who is one of our very experienced and fabulous peer support volunteers. Do you want to just say hi and then I'll share my screen, Ethna? Hello, everyone. Thank you. So I will share some slides with you. We will try and stick to time as I know we are uh, a little bit tight this afternoon. Um, so this is just an introduction to um, our presentation this afternoon, which is about a peer support model for perinatal mental health. Uh, we are a family action service. I'm employed by Family Action and we are funded through Better Start Bradford, which is a community fund lottery funded 10 year project. Um, some of the other Better Start programmes were represented this morning. Um, I'm Katie and Ethel is here with me and our service puts mums in the centre. However, going forward, Forward, particularly if keying into the family hub agenda, we really want to do a lot more work with dads. So I think both of us really enjoyed Helen's presentation about working with fathers and, and some learning for us to take forward from there. So uh, why do we do what we do? So this slide um, I first saw, I'm so sorry, um, go back to that one. This um, pie chart I first saw, it's credited on the slide, but I first saw this in um, a webinar called I Feel Like a Bad Mum. What I want to draw people's attention to here is this big blue section at the bottom of the screen here, um, the 72%. And this is mentally well mums who were also mentally well during their perinatal period, the period from when they were pregnant until their baby turned one or even two. They were mentally well during that time. But what they found was they still experienced negative thoughts. And those negative thoughts may have been related to their baby, to their pregnancy, to thoughts about labor, to their other children and wider family, to their partner. I think it's really notable here that these mums were mentally well in life generally and mentally well in this perinatal period, but still experienced these negative thoughts. And it's these mums that our service is mainly aimed at. We work in the mild to moderate perinatal mental illness 
um, sector, which is kind of represented by the little purple section on the pie chart. But we also work with lots of mums who just experience some low mood, some negative thoughts, maybe not even getting into that mild to moderate mental health issues, but are generally mentally well, but experience some struggles in the perinatal period. Why do we use peer support in our service? Why are we so passionate and committed to peer support and utilising this, this model? In 2020, Supportive, the peer support network, released a white paper which pulled together some studies, as you can see on the screen, and this really powerful quote, um, peer support was as effective as group cognitive behavioural therapy, or CBT. The magnitude of improvement seen from peer support was similar to psychotherapy or taking antidepressants. And we think that the reason for this is because our peer supporters are able to support mums to get from what you can see on the screen where a pregnant mum and a mum with a young baby meet up in the community or at a group or in a park. And one of them says to the other, how are you? And the other replies, I'm fine. And off they go about their day. But actually what we know and what that pie chart shows us from the previous slide is that neither of these mums are likely to be completely fine at this point. And actually there's a lot going on in their minds. What we feel peer support does is allow the mums to share all the thoughts and feelings that are going on in their minds. So taking them from this, what you can see on the screen now, to being able to share all of this, all these thoughts and feelings that they've got in their minds. I'm not going to read it out. Um, there's so much going on for mums, whether they've got a young baby or whether they are in the pregnant period, and obviously for dads as well, and just being able to share and offload. Why does peer support work in our service to provide this? So our peer supporters are trained mainly in active listening, really empathic, active listening, which involves really, really listening to mums and allowing them to talk and share. It, the peer support volunteer provides a really non-judgmental, safe and confidential space where mums feel that they can really get things off their chest, get a lift of weight off themselves, by sharing and offloading. Our peer support volunteers are not paid. And we feel that one of the reasons why our mums feel safe and comfortable to talk to those peer support volunteers is partly because they know that volunteer is there because they want to be there. They want to help. They want to listen. They want to be the best listening support that they can be because they're doing it voluntarily. And it is an unpaid situation what we get from our mums is that when they're in that situation with their peer support usually in a home visit but some of our peer support um, is provided over the phone or on a video call they feel that they can really share and offload and they feel really critically they feel that they are heard and therefore that their thoughts and feelings are validated. They get that reassurance, that reduction of isolation that comes through really being listened to and really being able to share. It's really important that we seek diverse and representational volunteers. I think a lot of what's been said this afternoon is about peer support needs to be really representative because we know that our mums want to talk to somebody who won't judge them or look down on them or patronise them in any way. And sometimes that is to do with feelings that somebody has a similar experience, that shared understanding, things in common. So that representative is really, really important. This slide talks about co-production and we, we're trying to bring more and more co-production, both with service users and volunteers because we feel this is the best way to bring voices that might be on the outside of our service although they're very important to our service into the center of how we develop and continue to evolve our service so we want to bring the voices of both our service users our clients our mums and our volunteers into what we're doing and we're doing that at the moment by co-producing case studies with clients and volunteers together with a paid member of staff to create a case study that really brings all those three voices, the professional voice, the voluntary voice and the client voice 
with the same value into that case study to tell those client stories. And we're also using volunteers like Ethna, who is here with me today, to interview and to support with training prospective volunteers who want to work with our service and provide that feedback loop where an existing experienced volunteer can help to bring on board a new volunteer and then continue to be able to provide our service. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Ethna, who's going to talk a little bit about her experience of being a peer support volunteer with our clients. Thank you, Ethna, for coming along with me today. Well, the advantages of volunteering. The first one is you just meet the most fantastic people. Um, the, the other day, I had, I had a telephone conversation with a client who had, I, I was a bit irritated that she'd been pissing me about. I thought actually she'd been ill. She'd had some terrible things happen. But I was irritated when I started the conversation and I was being very self-controlled. By the time I came away from it, I was thinking, oh, what a wonderful woman. Wasn't that lovely? Didn't I do well? Isn't she great? Oh, that's fantastic. And, you know, it's not just the clients. It's the people I work with, Katie and all her colleagues. I'll go on to that later. But also, you know, I've been a mum, I've been a grandma. I even worked in, the first, in Bradford's first flagship children's centre. And so I'd lost a lot, a lot of those skills and I'd lost a lot of self-confidence because after I retired, I volunteered somewhere else for a while. But then my mum was very ill and needed a lot of support and then died and it was all very depressing. And I just was at a flat bottom then, saw an advertisement for this. And it's really brought back my self-confidence and reminded me of how many skills I had before. Uh, the only disadvantage is that it's time consuming. And I didn't really take into account the fact that I need to write reports afterwards. And I enjoy writing them, so I've taken quite a lot of time, but you don't have to. But also that home visits involve a lot of time to organize and to travel, especially if you're a green echo or you're like me and you insist on taking public transport. So in fact, for me, I've found through a more hybrid model, spending quite a lot of time on WhatsApp usually, has worked very well, especially as several of my clients have actually lived quite a long way from the base. Uh, but if I didn't want to go to their house, we could all meet up here at the base. It, it, we can be very, very flexible. But that is really the only disadvantage, and it just needs a little bit of planning. And it's such fun that, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, I've had fantastic training and support, and I was a teacher for most of my life. And I must say, the supervision that I get here is much, much better. And I feel that I'm being supervised, whereas as a teacher, what was really being supervised was, was the school able to tick all its boxes? Because they're always, anyway, that's it. Um, the training I got originally was in a small group that was online because it was during COVID. And it was a very inclusive group. And there was lots of interaction, very good resources, because I thought at the beginning, oh, I know what about training. Because of my working on blah blah blah, but actually, I was really impressed by the resources and the links, and I, I learned a lot. And the support just goes on and on, especially with your first clients. I mean, I'm a bit more independent now, but I know that I have email and telephone contact whenever I want it. I'm always impressed by how quickly it comes back. I'm supposed to phone in before and after every visit, but given that they're online, I don't always remember to do that. There are occasional social events that are great fun. And there is a WhatsApp group, but actually I don't pay much attention to that because I don't feel that particularly supportive. But I know there are some people who use it a lot for social interaction. And yes, and I'm now getting involved in training and in this kind of activity. All the training events for new trainees, that as I said, they're in a small, they're in small initial groups. But they always involve myself or some other couple of volunteers in the planning and setup of them. And I forgot much more. I'll be taking up time to start talking about myself, so I'll shut up. But it's great. Thank you so much, Esther, and thank you for talking so warmly about what we put in place to ensure that our volunteers do feel well supervised and well supported. We'll finish there, Bronya. Thank you very much. 
thank you. Thanks to both of you. That's fantastic. And I know there's been a lot of activity in the chat. So if anyone's able to answer any of the questions, but if there's anything that we sort of don't get to, because I know that we haven't got very long, you know, I'm sure we can pick those up. Um, but one thing I want to ask, um, Ethne, sort of if, do you sort of, as a peer supporter, have any advice for anyone who's starting out with their family hubs and with peer support? And, you know, I'm going to ask every member of the panel this, so <laughs> don't feel under pressure to have all of the answers. But, on, you know, as a peer supporter yourself, do you have any advice for anyone who's setting up this kind of service? Do it. Believe in yourself. <laughs> and... Just be careful you don't slide into advice. I find that really, really hard. But when I do it, I just say, oh, don't listen to me. I'm no phony. <laughs> I'm not supposed to give advice. Don't, don't tell my supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, I'm really glad Ethna brought that up, actually. We are very keen. One of the feedbacks that we get from uh, a lot of our mums, the clients that we work with, is some of them do have somebody to talk to, a family member, a friend. It was really interesting when... Um, one of the previous speakers was saying about um, intergenerational families, and we have quite a lot of those in the area of Bradford where we work. Um, and often mums have far too much advice and they don't get listened to. They just get talked to and told what they should be doing. So part of the training for our volunteers is to ensure that volunteers do not give unsolicited advice. If a mum is to ask a volunteer, what would you do? They have some training in some basic levels of stuff, attachment parenting and things like that. But they would never give that advice unsolicited. They are there to listen and to allow that mum to share her thoughts and feelings and uh, to resist the temptation, as Esther has just so um, clearly described, to give that advice where it isn't wanted. Yeah. Well, I won't say that's good advice, but it's a good answer to the question. <laughs> so I'd like to open that question up to the other members of the panel, um, Kirsten, Helen and Samira. You know, if people are just starting out in on their family hubs journey, what is the one piece of advice you might give them about sort of peer support? I think just picking up on what Katie was saying, I think that giving unsolicited personal views, I think especially when it comes to infant feeding, which is such a, such could be a very controversial, sensitive, emotive subject for lots of people. Um, and it, I imagine it could be quite easy to say, oh, I did this and I used to do this. And back in my day, it wasn't like this. Um, so especially for infant feeding, just making sure, and it comes back to what Kirsten was saying around the quality assurance, just making sure you have those procedures in place to make sure that the advice that the peer support service is giving out is evidence-based um, and it is quality assured because it could be quite, it can be quite easy just to kind of, drift off into your own messages which when it does come to you know a topic like infant feeding um could be quite dangerous great any other reflections yeah i just to add to that i think that if that the point that was just made is put into the training to the the volunteer peer supporters um it, you know the, the fact that these individuals um have training in active listening or, you know, how to get those messages out. Because I think certainly the, 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 when you sign up to these things as a peer, you might think, oh, because I've done this, people want to hear about my own experiences. Um, and I even see this with practitioners, you know, that they will talk about, well, back in the day, or uh, this is how we were taught, um, or this is the way I did it. And, and the fact that matter is you don't know how that's going to be received. And so there needs to be some training about who you are in that role as a peer supporter, um, not just, and, and also being trained that you can't be friends with everybody, that there does have to be some boundaries um, and that that needs to be built in because so often we see just, I see locally in my own community that people will set up these things and, and think, oh, everybody will just come along and then they'll go out. We did one recently, for example, about responsible dog ownership. And it, 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 you still kind of need to be have some kind of training or what, what are we going to, what are we endorsing through this activity versus what you want to do on your own agenda and why you might have signed up. That's great. Thanks. And Helen, any final reflections from you? No, I think I just agree with Kirsten, particularly around the um, training element of that and particularly around that um, ability to actively listen. 
um, and you know, and for us to enable the fathers that will be peer supporting other fathers to to enable them to have that um, training and, and and development and that partnership um, awareness really. So yes, thank you. That, that's all from me. I think. That's brilliant. And um, I'd like to say thank you to all of you um, for your contributions today. Um, it's, I'm really, really um, appreciative, all of us are, of the time that you've given us. And you've um, created a lot of interest um, in this breakout session. The chat's been very active and we will aim to pick up all of those questions. But um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues who've been helping behind the um, scenes as well. But um, I know we have a break coming up and um, it's not that long until the next session. So I'd just like to say thank you once again for joining us. Thanks to all of our speakers. Thanks to our technical people behind the scenes. And um, you should be able to join the next session um, using the link that's currently on the screen. Hopefully that's been emailed to you. If you have any questions at all, please do contact our training team. And um, thank you and have a good afternoon. <laughs>